Well, this is the first time I've been given a topic to lecture on. Usually she calls me and she says, what would you like to talk about? So I can go to a file. <laughs> this time I couldn't go to a file. So this required new, new work. <laughs> Did anyone come to the last two lectures that I gave here? Do you remember what I lectured about? Green Man. Shamanism. Okay. okay, I'm going to put them up here. Uh, first was shamanism. That was the last lecture, right? And what else? What was Green the Man. Green. Was that before the shamanism? Yeah, yeah. Green Man. Okay, what was the lecture before that? Okay. I can't remember what it, I remember that it had to do with the Middle East, something about the Middle East. Middle East influences. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I did not expect the last four lectures to, to lead to this one because this one was given to me from outside of my normal field of interest. And uh, when I started looking into ley lines, I realized that ley lines are what unified every previous lecture. Um, so fortunately, if you go back and look at these, you'll see that there's actually a course in study that ends up with what ley lines are. So I'm going to walk through these, and we're going to do a sort of collage and look at chief features, and we're going to connect the dots up to the ley lines, if that's okay with everybody. Okay? Shamanism. Um, originally a word used to describe the representative who stands between the world of the human being and other dimensions. True or false? True. Okay, good. That was a lecture about what makes miracles work. So, <clears throat> what makes miracles work is the ritual application of natural forces <coughs> and I realize that there's a lot in that statement but I'll review this and, and we'll move on very quick what makes prayer work is the correct application of mental and psychic forces in a ritual and what the ritual does is it concentrates all the unconscious force, which usually does not get tapped. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. Now the ritual must be physical, because the subconscious is convinced by the physical. It needs drama. The ritual provides the drama for the shadow and for the subconscious, which is then awakened and rises to the occasion. That's what the shaman does. So, the chief feature is the mediation and application of power. Does that make sense? Now, the green man is, in essence, in all cultures, and he has two forms, he goes back about 5,000 years in every culture. Sometimes he's depicted as a man with a face that's got foliation, leaves. Sometimes it's acanthus, sometimes it's willow, and it varies. Sometimes the green man is not botanical. Sometimes he's luminous, and he's the color of phosphorus. So he's associated with certain minerals that glow at night. When the sun shines on during the day, they can store up light. Am I making sense so far? The green man occurs throughout history. He's called by different names. <clears throat> and uh, that's a complete study. In some ways, you could say the green man is the teacher of the shaman. The green man is the 
a live conscious force of nature that's trying to teach people who want to learn from him or from her because there's a green woman too but she has a slightly different role where you see green in esoterics throughout history you see the doctrine of the temenos which is the sacred space and it might be a grove of trees or a hillock or a barrow so far so good that's where the green man lives okay. the Knights Templar they did a lot of different things <coughs> the evidence suggests they returned the goddess to Christianity through the work of St. Bernard. So when they were formed as a Christian military order, their charter was written by St. Bernard, whose intention was to bring in the significance of the mother goddess, so he introduced the rituals involving the mother of God back into the Roman Catholic Church. Up until that time, they were not emphasized. <coughs> so the reason you see Mary emphasized in the Roman Catholic Church is because <coughs> of St. Bernard, who also wrote a charter for his nephew, who started the... What? Nice. Yeah. And so the connection is through the, the goddess... <coughs> the green goddess and also the green man, there's also uh, documented evidence that the Templars were mixing rituals with the Catholic rituals. And some of them might have been Arabic, some of them might have been Persian. But the name has come up in research on fragments, and the name is Kudr. Now, the Arabic name for the green man is Kidder, and he's in the 18th chapter of the Quran. And he's not called by name, but in the commentaries they call him Kidder. He's just called the ever verdant one, the one who cannot die, <clears throat> the one who knows the secrets of nature, the one who can mediate the power, the one who can teach. So, all these influences have come out of the cradle of civilization, right? Garden of Eden, Iraq, it's all very relevant now because of the turmoil. These things can all be traced back to the earliest history of human culture and into the Middle East where the Knights Templar returned, where the green man comes from. In fact, to this day in Turkey, there are shrines all up and down the Turkish coast dedicated to the green man. And if, you're, if you go there as a tourist, they will not take you there because they're not Islamic. And they're afraid you might think that uh, there's some problem with the faith. But those shrines are still treasured and they're along the coast and there's a place along the coast of Turkey where annually the water turns from salt to sweet one time a year and the people go out in the ocean and they drink the water by the handful and they say that's when Elijah and the green man pass by the water changes because they have the secret of natural forces <clears throat> the reason I'm going over this is just so the last four lectures have some congruency with what we're going to talk about today so those of you who weren't here for the last ones, bear with me and I'll erase this stuff. <clears throat> now, when I got the telephone call, <laughs> can you speak about ley lines? And I thought, ley lines. <laughs> well, I knew ley because that's my brother's middle name, L-E-I-G-H. <laughs> And that word, lay, is connected to the word lame. And uh, the term ley line was popularized by a man named Watkins. 
in 1920. And I'll read a little bit of uh, the Watkins report. Is that the Watkins of Watkins and Creek? Maybe. Uh, June 30, 1921, an English businessman was riding his horse across the hills when he was suddenly struck by a kind of revelation that the English countryside is crisscrossed by various footpaths and farm tracks. But as Alfred Watkins looked down from his hilltop, it struck him there seemed to be another network of lines connecting up old churches, standing stones, hilltops, ancient mounds. In some cases, there were still remains of old straight tracks carved in the ground. But it seemed to him that such had once existed, forming a network of straight lines across the landscape. He called the system of old straight tracks, lays or lees, borrowing the word from the archaeological writer Williams Freeman, who had also pointed out that ancient landmarks seemed to be connected by invisible tracks. So the term is recent. The Chinese call them, uh, I think they call them Lung Mei, which is the dragon veins. Okay. There's uh, um, an art of landscaping in China, and it's finally caught, caught on in this country. You know what that art is called? The art of designing your environment. Okay. Feng Shui is the Chinese interpretation of ley lines. And Feng comes from the Chinese word which means wind, as in typhoon, which correctly pronounces typhoon. Okay. Shui is the Chinese word for water. Okay. And so Feng Shui is the science of the wind and water, roughly translated as the science of current. Now, when you deal with Chinese words, you deal with concepts. So when they say wind, it may be something that acts like the wind. It may not be wind per se. So if we go back to this idea of the shaman being the mediator of power, it would be necessary for a good shaman to know how to mediate the wind and the water. <coughs> Am I making sense so far? <clears throat> so if you build your house near a dam, and the dam has a crack in it, is that good feng shui or bad feng shui? Bad. <laughs> if you build your house, and there's no windows, <laughs> is that good feng shui or bad feng shui? Bad. Okay. So you already know feng shui, but if you want to go take a course, that's fine too. This feng shui, these ley lines, <clears throat> there's an outside and an inside. So if we walk through a forest and we come to a stream, we can see how that stream moves, and we can see where the fish are, and we can see where the sandbars are, and we can see if the water's clean or not. Now what the ancients found was that water behaved differently on a full moon because the viscosity of water increases. So you can float a heavier log in a small stream on a full moon. How do you like that? <laughs> and they found that by watching. Now there was a, an Austrian uh, naturalist named Victor Schauberger who studied water as a personality and he said you must understand what water likes to do and what it wants because the water has a mind of its own and uh, they didn't know what to do with Victor Schauberger because he didn't have a degree this is in the early 1900s and uh, the Austrian government wanted him to have a degree because they were giving him responsibilities for designing log flumes you know what log flumes are? Yeah. Okay. Now theoretically, if you float a log down a flume, the flume has to be straight. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, victors look like this. <coughs> and they said, you can't design it that way, because the log will get stuck when it comes to a corner. And he said, you don't understand what water likes to do. <coughs> and they didn't get it. Well, what he would do is Victor would take <clears throat> he would take a tube like this, okay, and he would bend it, okay, and when he bent the flume, he would put little wooden fish fins inside it. You couldn't see see them very much; they just stuck up like little fins. So when the water went into the flume, the water would start to rotate like this, start to spiral. So when he would put a log in the flume, as it reached velocity, the water would twist and bend the log. And the witnesses who watched his flumes work say you could hear the logs crack. Because he knew what water liked. And so he found one set of principles that superseded another set of principles. Both were natural. Am I making sense so far? Okay. So you're with me on Victor Schauberger and the mystery of the cracking logs. <laughs> <laughs> That's just an out of work story, right? No, it's true. He lived. You can find him on the web. His work was confiscated by the U.S. government because he developed an anti-gravity motor that used water as fuel. Okay. Died in poverty, but his work is preserved somewhat by his son. The rest is classified. He was bought out by the government How do you for being too smart. Schauberger. Schauberger. Victor Schauberger. Very brilliant humanitarian. And they did give him a title, the King of Austria, and said, you know, we can't call you a naturalist, so we're going to call you the Master of the Wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> so he got his, got his certificate. Um, so Victor Schauberger is a significant figure in the last century, well, two centuries before now, because he combined a deep empathy with nature with a sense of engineering. So he was a human being who represented the bridge between standing under the tutelage of the green man and being able to adapt that emotional wisdom to modern technology with the log flume. So he treated water like it was alive, but he was able to convert that to sound engineering. Everybody with me? So he's a main bridge on this. It's very significant. He was the shaman who stepped into the modern world, Victor Schauberger. And he was one of many. <clears throat> now we're going to go back to essential ideas, which I'm fond of because, as you all know, I'm a sort of Platonist. <clears throat> and I think that the basics can get us through most things if we really understand what the basics are. And the basics can always be found within the human body because that's the temple and it has all of the symbolism of the spirit. So we're going to look at the ley lines or the currents that are in your body. And you know what they are. Name one set of currents in your body, anybody. Chakras. Chakras. Well, really, to this group, to start with the sophisticated first. Give me another. The brains. Okay. The noddings. That's a subdivision up here, right? You have about what, 8,000 or 72,000? 72, 72,000, okay. More? Glen, nervous glen, system. Nervous system. Glen, glen. Nervous and glen. <laughs> nervous, glandular. And we're all aware these all interconnect, <coughs> but they also operate in their own way. They all have their preferences. Anything else? DNA, RNA. 
Okay, the genetic template. Anything else? Pranas. Yeah, that's uh, those are those are more like broad fields, aren't they? I'm going to put them out here. Cranial rhythmic impulse. The cranial system, the cranial rhythmic impulse. Okay, that would be. I would put that under pranas. Those are phenomena of magnetism. Okay, are we out yet? We finished. Biorhythms. Biorhythms. Those are large. Those are large pranas, but they're very significant because if you give someone a shot in the arm on one day, it can kill them, and a shot on another day, and it won't kill them. So timing. When you deal with the biorhythms, you're talking about the science of time, which is also um, very different. Now, I'm bringing these up because you're all aware of these, and up to a degree, I'm sure most of you accept these as functioning in your body. True or false? Okay, now, everything you see here also exists in the earth, okay, in one form or another. We're going to look at the most basic forms of ley lines, <clears throat> and uh, they correspond, I would say, for our purposes, we'll be looking at this division for today, for the sake of convenience, pranas being the great airs, or the great waves of power that go through the, the skin of the earth. Okay, The meridians correspond roughly to underwater springs. So if we have a dowser, do we have any dowsers? Anyone who douses? Okay. Well, the dowsing is, of course, significant. So we're dealing with pranas or meridians, we're dealing with currents, and we're dealing with water because it's the easiest thing for you to imagine because you can see water trickling and running and moving. Now, <clears throat> what's interesting is animals sense this water. And so if a man or a woman cannot feel the water, they can find an animal that will take them to the water because of the smell. So a trained human being can locate water by smell but it doesn't usually occur naturally. But there is something we have that does occur naturally. We have a deposit of iron at the base of our nose which allows us to sense magnetic north by turning our head. And if we get a slight tingle, we know which way is north. Some people have more iron at the base of their nose than others. But if you have it, you can actually acquire this. It's not difficult. So you have a compass in your nose. <coughs> now we're going to talk about water and iron. Okay. And your nose. And you know there's a third eye in there. We don't even need to get sophisticated because we're talking about the basic, not the sophisticated part. The water goes under the earth. There's groundwater. Okay. Then there's deep subterranean water. Now occasionally, there's a place where springs inter intersect one another. And sometimes there's as many as six. Okay? Usually there's as many as five or six. Sometimes there's one spring. Sometimes there's two springs together. Sometimes there's three springs coming together. Um, so later on, these things were sometimes symbolized by shapes. So I want you to realize if you see that, it might mean something that you're not expecting. It might mean there's six springs intersect, intersecting one another, and, and there are. And sometimes there's eight. And those were two of the forms used for the heart chakra, okay, where there are several springs that mingle. Now, animals, if you've got water, let's put a critter up here. Well, we're doing the shaman thing, so let's make it a stag. Stag walking along, feels the water, there's a pool, okay? Sometimes there's more than one, there's a fountain. 
and this will be like an oasis, and it will be marked by trees. These things can be found, they're visible. <clears throat> What's often not mentioned is that uh, the animals wear trails through the woods to these places. Not people, animals. I, I live in the mountains and I, I walk down deer trails every day. And they're well marked. And the deer have very specific areas where they go for water and where they stay out of visual sighting and where they move at night and they know where the hunters are and where they're not. So the deer has this feng shui built into the survival. So I have the idea that the feng shui and the, the knowing the water and knowing the placement, all of these things have a very simple survival application, which is about staying alive, staying healthy, having water, good food, safe place. These are not high esoterics, these are essentials for staying alive on the planet. Am I making sense to you? Okay. So, <clears throat> what has happened is over time, some of these places where there's plenty of water, you get these really big trees. Sometimes you get these really big trees because there's plenty of water on the ground. And when a tree is 500 years old, it's big enough to hide in. You can climb up and build a house. Some trees are hit by lightning and the core will burn out and the entire tree will stay alive. It will be hollow. It will become a sacred tree. <coughs> it will bud in the spring, but you can climb up inside it. I had a tree like that when I was growing up as a kid. We'd go see it. It was the wonder. You know? It was the local wonder. And it was by a stream. So, sacred areas form based on the movement of these currents and the animals go there because where there's water there's life and there's safety I'm not saying they're completely safe you may have a crocodile or something but as a rule the places that have the current become sacred places to the animals we're not even up to the human yet okay the animals go to these places because <coughs> that's where they feel good Say, fed. Sanctuary, right? Now, when the humans come along, all they notice is, if they're hunters, this is a good place to bag an animal. So to the human, that looks like a sacred place, too, because you can go and eat. There's another kind of human. Because there have always been hunters of some kind or another, there have always been healers. And what a healer does with a sacred place is not what a hunter does with a sacred place. So you have two children. One is muscular, fiery, competitive. You teach him to hunt. You're getting old. You have a son. You teach him to hunt because you're not going to be able to do that because your your arms are starting to get arthritis. You can't pull the bow like you used to. You train your son. You have another son or a daughter. This one is not uh, not got the fire. Always daydreaming, gazing out the window. Unreal, the unreal child. You know. Okay, what do you do with it? Can't make him hunt. In the ancient times, they, they would say, watch that one. Because the spirits are talking to them. The gods are talking to them. So watch it. So, so here's, your, here's your archer. Okay. Yeah, I like to kill things. Time to eat. Good, strong, everything's good. Here's your wonderful underground current. Here's your pool. Oh, you caught a deer drinking water. Time for venison. Okay, here's your daydreamer. He's sitting here, standing here. See, he's looking at the deer. This other one, he feels something. He gets dizzy. He's sick at his stomach. 
knees feel funny. It feels like there's something under him moving. You can't describe it. it tastes like chocolate. It tastes like lime. Um, I feel weird all over. I feel like I have bologna in my shoes. I can't describe this. When I go there, I fall asleep. And I can't wake up. Because there's this power coming up from the springs. And the power is magnetic. And the nervous system is also has a magnetic current in it. So some of these more sensitive types, they can feel this. So this, I want you to see this, this type will go and bag a deer, and this one will go and sit in reverie and write poetry and, and feel things. But for both of them, it's a sacred site because where you go, it's what? Life. It's life. Play, these places give life somehow, one way or another. So be very clear that's the first mark of a sacred spot. Now they can be doused, and dousing's been around a long time, okay? And they can be felt without dousing. And usually, what they find is if you douse and you look down, there's two lines of power if you're dousing. You can find two lanes like a two-lane highway. And so this is where they got the idea that they were tracks. Because usually there's not one, there's usually a pair. Okay. And one may go off a little or disappear, the other may go straight. Okay. This may go, go under and come back up. But usually they run in pairs. And we know that the current in the body runs in pairs. And uh, I can explain this by saying, which nostril are you breathing in right now? You can try it. Are you breathing in your left nostril or your right? Try it. Tell me what you're Most of you should be breathing in your left. I'll tell you why later. But who's breathing in your left? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Most of you are. Who's breathing in your right? Raise your hand straight up. That's almost a perfect yin yang combination. The right nostril is uh, electric and the left is magnetic. So you change hourly, and the third hour you're half in each. So you're constantly running an electrical magnetic pulse okay, through your body, and your brain is moving in tandem with that pulse. And the right nostril is this guy, and the left nostril is this one. So if you're in an aggressive mood, you'll, chances are you're in the right nostril. And if you wake up thinking of the lilies of the field, you're in this left nostril. So we carry these two with us through the day, okay? And then on the third hour, you're about half and half. Now. The standard statement on enlightenment is this when both nostrils are open continually and there's no longer a flow of alteration. It's a continual emanation. And they say you're illuminated because the power in the body is constant. There is no pulse. It's like a lighthouse. <clears throat> but most of us haven't gotten there yet. So we have this pulsation. Electric magnetic <clears throat> and between them our friend water and in us it could be the spinal fluid or the blood both of them have water so these currents moving through us all the time and over the earth all the time possible pulsation all the time at different depths and heights. Now let's say that we have an electric cable here, but it's not really a cable, it's in it's by by river you feel that you can pick up electricity. Okay? We won't go into the details for now. Electricity on one side magnetism on the other. Now if you're a shaman and you've been talking to the green man or the green woman, 
and this is a sacred place and you want to make it more sacred and you think this is electrical when I'm here I get warm when I sit on this stone my body's warm that's electric if I sit on the stone over there and I cool off it's magnetic okay. and there are tastes associated with these currents also a lemon is what? electric So, a shaman will have enough of a facility to say, I want to make this more. He'll have to figure out something that conducts electricity. He's walking along the river and there's electrical current over here. What will a shaman add? Salt. Say it. Salt. Salt. Yeah. Salt's possible. What minerals conduct electricity? Iron, copper, zinc. Which conducts electricity the fastest? Gold. gold. What's second to gold? Silver. Silver. Yep. Now we're starting to figure out what this jewelry business is about. Well, why would they just stick a piece of gold on their body? Yeah. So that's the electric side. Let's just sprinkle some of this over here. Now, they've known about the lodestone a long time. So if they want to increase magnetism, what mineral do they put on that side of the river? Fine. Anything else? Hematite. Tell me more. Okay. They can feel it, so they'll find it. They'll find it with their hands touching stones. They'll find it. They'll put it over there. So what they're going to do is, the shaman is going to build these things up so that there's going to be much more force flowing around. Okay. Am I making sense to you all? With very simple materials. Now this same shaman, he might go and shoot a deer and eat it and he'll get the skin. He'll find when he puts the skin on his body at night, it's very warm, so it's electric. It helps the electrical part. And he might decide, you know, this would be a good healing skin if I sewed something onto it. You ever heard of the golden fleece? Okay. Do you know how that was made? Golden fleece? You know? Well, in Afghanistan, they would put sheepskins in the stream, in the mountain streams, and tie them down and spike them in the ground. And the water would flow over the sheepskin, and the sheepskin would filter out gold powder from the water. And they would get the sheepskin out and dry it in the sun. And then you'd see the gold. You'd see it shine. You'd see the gold sparkles in the sheepskin. Now, when you put that sheepskin on someone who's ill, you can produce a real fever and cure them. Because the gold is what? Electric. Okay. And you know about the Ark of the Covenant. You guys know about the Ark of the Covenant? No. No. Okay. Children of Israel in the Old Testament had this box with sacred objects, and the box was made of a particular kind of wood, and the box was painted with gold. And when they were in the desert, they would get these little rock badger skins. They would cover a few feet over the gold, would be this tiny, these little tiny creatures, animal skins, little badgers, desert badgers, and they would cover with a canopy over this gold box. And the wind would blow across those skins. What do you get when you rub your feet on the floor? Uh -huh. And there'd be this static field of tremendous power because they're in the desert, it's very dry. And that gold box under those badger skins with a tremendous electrical field around it because it was sealed gold. And of course, if you read the accounts, you were not to touch it because you would die. It was holy and you would die. You bet you would die. <laughs> okay. So, someone had been studying with the green man. In, in the Old Testament, the green man is Enoch. Enoch Melchizedek is part of the green man tradition. It goes into the Essenes and all that sort of thing. But what I wanted you to be aware of was the currents in the ground could be magnified naturally with simple materials and this is something you can do for yourself. Okay. 
this is the source of what jewelry was used for on the human body was to increase electricity or magnetism using these currents. And of course you know if you don't have enough water you die. So in a human body or in most biological entities you have to have enough water. True or false? And if you go to a paramedic or if you're in a car accident and you're laying there, the paramedic walks up and he puts one tube in one forearm and one tube in the other. Tell me what's in those tubes. Sugar. One sugar and one's salt. 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 So that's your uh, positive and negative field. Sugar and salt. And so these forces are essential, moving through you constantly. You're always using them. And whether you're a poet or a warrior, you're going to find these are the forces you engage with. All right? And we'll add one, usually depicted this way. Positive, negative, and neutralizing. And a neutralizing force is what happens when there's a pause in the beat of the music. It's when you go from one nostril to the next. It's when the charge starts to shift. That was called neutralizing or resting force. But it was classified as a force. <clears throat> um, this, these are the essentials of, of what a ley line is. Now, if we look at where you find them or what they do, in modern times, the best thing I can, I can give you that will take in all the historical data is a European cathedral because it embodies a lot of time and what you do with the ley line when it sits. Is that okay? So we're going to talk about what happened to the ley lines when Christianity became an empire and we've got about a minute so it's going to be rather quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, oh, there's our big cathedral. Big boxes. Alrighty. It didn't always look like that, you know. It used to look like this. It was made out of stone, like a stone igloo. Sometimes they look like beehives. In Ireland, you can get a stone cairn with, a, with an arch, and you don't go up into the church, you go down into the mother. So there's a, a little statue with her legs open, it's a woman being obscene. But they didn't think it was obscene, they thought it was holy. And that was called a gargoyle. It became a gargoyle when they applied it to the big cathedrals. Is but, it a sweat log? Uh, it could be. The main thing was, is several steps down was an earthen chamber okay, where you would go for ritual magic. And it was lined with sacred stones and minerals and water and things, fire. But over time, things changed. One person conquered another, but all they knew was if you went to this place, you had a certain feeling because underneath this place, was lots of stuff happening. Am I making sense? So whoever was here, they had this feeling. So the architecture changed. You know, let's make that bigger, bigger, better. But, you know. We need to think more of heaven and less of the earth, so let's go this way. Because <laughs> some of these things went very far down. You go into Mother Earth, you may go down a long way. Uh, in Vatican City, if you walk the rosary, the underground rosary in the Vatican is the catacombs of the old Christians. And it's actually connected to very old pagan rites. And you go under the city, and it's 12 stories down. Well... That's as far as they'll let you go. <laughs> and after that, no. Sorry. Um, so this can be very deep. 
Christianity said, oh, let's go this way. So the cairn, the palace of the queen, the beehive, the underground sacred place where you go, the womb of the earth where you go to be reborn, became a kind of aerial, a kind of bird's nest. Okay? That's what happened when paganism made the conversion to Christianity. So if there was a um, little table, of course, you always make an offering to the God, and if we look at the most the oldest offerings, like the, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, if we look at something really old, six, eight thousand years old, what they do is they would get a bowl carved out of lapis, very blue, blue lapis bowl. And they would fill it with raw honey. There would be one with honey and one with butter, because that is the product of very fine work. Both butter and honey are very fine, refined substances. So they would offer that on the little table, and that would be for the sacred cairn or the beehive of the mother. Okay, and they would put that table. It would be directly over a multi-fountain-headed spring. So there was a big field, and the food would get impregnated with the field. So it would have a particular taste, especially if you left it for a week. And if you ate it on a full moon, it would have a very strong taste. Not always pleasant, but unforgettable. Okay, so you've got to look at the psychological uh, value of this. Now later, the offering table was substituted in the Christian tradition for the communion table. That's where they put the bread and the wine, which of course is really a very ancient, pre-Christian, pre-everything uh, ritual. And uh, if there was not a spring under the altar, sometimes there's a door, and guess what? There's a stairway going down to the real place. And in Greece, I've known men go down those doors and walk up to two miles and never find the end and turn around again because they don't know where it's going. Um, so I want you to see the connection of the currents to ritual offerings in all religions and the connection of the currents to uh, sacred places because all the old churches are built over multi-headed springs. All the cathedrals in Europe are. And if you go to the cathedral at Chartres, and you talk to Wolfgang, who's the German guide, who, who knows sacred work. He will take you to the spring at the cathedral at Chartres, which is a black goddess cathedral, okay, that was then rebuilt onto by the Christians. Okay. And he'll show you the spring in the well underneath the church, and he will say, it's not living anymore. The current's moved. So there's a little water in the well, but the well's not full. So the, the current has come off course, and the water started flowing in another direction. So some sacred places are there as a memory, but they are no longer what? They're no longer alive. No longer sacred. No longer sacred. No longer living. <coughs> so the role of the shaman was to guide the currents. He could guide them. He could dig irrigation canals. There's more than one way to do that. He could lay stone in places so water would be attracted, so electricity would be attracted, so magnetism would be attracted. So <clears throat> these things figure into to what happened. Now our churches in America, I don't know how many of them are built on springs. Some of the oldest ones may be, but I think that tradition didn't survive uh, export. But you will find sacred uh, places in American Indian spots in this country, like at burial mounds and other things like that. So you can find them here, but they're not necessarily in the churches. But if you go to Europe, a lot of the churches and temples have a distinct feeling. And in fact, 
one way to know if is still alive, if a church is still alive or a temple is still alive, is to walk barefoot and see if you feel the pulse in your feet because you'll feel a kind of a, a beat. So that's a sort of overview of ley lines. How's that? <laughs> Helpful. Thanks. So now you're going to all go out and find the ley lines. I just wanted to ask, are, are ley lines like the lines in Tai Chi? Yes and no. Um, tai Chi as a symbol or Tai Chi as a martial art? Because Tai Chi as a symbol is this. You guys recognize that? That's called a, it's called a grand terminus. No, as a martial art. As a martial art, yes. But there's two ways to raise your arm. If you raise your arm for circulation, you extend it so the blood can flow. True or false? True or false. Let <laughs> me okay. put it this way. If your garden hose has kinks in it, will the water flow through it faster or slower? Slower. Okay. And if you extend it, what happens? Okay. So in Tai Chi, there are movements for the circulation and there are movements for defense. So these are two different things. But they're both sacred, but the application is different because this is not going to make your arm have good circulation. It's going to protect your ear. <laughs> okay. But this is going to extend the blood vessels and stretch the nerves like yoga. So they're both sacred, but they don't do the same thing. In other words, the ancient mind that was a, in a state of atavism, and by that I mean the world was seen as a seamless unity, so that health and self-defense were not considered separate things. If a movement kept you from being hit in the head, it was also sacred. <laughs> Am I making sense to you? Right. The vision of the world was as a unified fabric, not as a compartmentalized thing at all. So the archer and the poet would consider the same place sacred because both things were necessary. Is that clear to everyone? Yeah. Okay.